thank you for joining our webinar, Words to Say, Things to Do, How to Help Your Loved One Living with Bipolar Disorder and Yourself. I'd like to remind you all that if there's time, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you're attending through Zoom, you can type your question into the Q&A chat box. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can just leave a comment. I'm honored to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Susan J. Noonan. Dr. Noonan is a physician, an author, an advocate, and a certified peer specialist. And she is also a long-term patient living with depression on the bipolar spectrum. She currently serves as a consultant to the Massachusetts General Hospital and McLean Hospital. As a physician who has counseled, supported, and advocated for those living with and those caring for a person with mental illness, and as someone who has lived experience herself, she bridges that gap between provider and recipient of mental health care services. Her interest is in bringing mental illness management strategies to people who do not have access to health technology, mental health care, educational programs, or the opportunity to learn these skills in any other way. She draws on personal experience and evidence-based information in her writing, interviews, and presentations to convey concise and practical advice for an individual managing a mood disorder and for families caring for someone with a mental illness. Susan has written five books published by Johns Hopkins University Press about managing and caring for someone with depression. And today she will talk about how to help a loved one who is living with bipolar. Thank you so much for joining us today, Susan. You're welcome to get started whenever you're ready. Well, thank you for having me. I'll just take a moment now to share my screen with all of you. Um, so just give me a moment for this and then we'll get started. Hold on a minute. It doesn't. We did do this properly before, so hold on a minute. There we go. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I'm going to begin by briefing, briefly telling you a little bit about me and my journey, which Natalie so very nicely summarized. Then I'll share my thoughts on your struggles as a family member or a friend. There's a lot to cover and we won't be able to get it all in great detail. So I refer you to my latest book for those who are interested. And please use the chat as Natalie has said to just communicate any areas of interest or your questions. So my name is Susan Noonan and I come to you with a unique perspective as a physician and long-term patient living with depression. I bridge that gap between recipient and provider of mental health care services and can speak from firsthand experience backed by medical evidence about what things are like and what really helps. I have a long history of severe depression beginning as a teenager and lasting until now, but most of the time it went untreated that just wasn't done, at least not in my family. My treatment didn't begin until the age of 45. And it took a very long time with many different intensive mental health treatments and extraordinary perseverance on everybody's part. But eventually after many years, we found the best treatment regimen for me. I improved and learned how to manage my illness. In that effort, I've had an awesome team of mental health providers who held hope for me when I had absolutely none. I learned to borrow hope from them. So now let's think about what we're dealing with. Mood disorders such as bipolar disorder or major depression are a common biologically based illness of the mind and body that affects the thoughts, feelings, actions, everyday lives of many people in fact about 45 million people worldwide, and approximately just under 3% of the adult population in this country every year. The symptoms and diagnoses are defined by a set of criteria that are created by the American Psychiatric Association and published in a book called the DSM-5, which you may be familiar with. 
So how does that translate to your loved one who has bipolar disorder? So here are some things you might see. The person might have lost flavor for life, no longer participates, might have a change in their appearance, in their dress, hair, hygiene, sleep, appetite, weight, friends, or performance at work or school. They may be socially very isolated and withdrawn, irritable, or argumentative. Some may have fatigue or others just very high energy and elation with little or no need for sleep. If manic, someone may have grandiose thoughts that she or she can do just about anything or racing thoughts and poor concentration and high risk behaviors such as spending sprees sexual drives, driving too fast, alcohol or drug use, things you may be familiar with. Now we like to think of mood disorders as a family illness for two reasons. They can be genetic and they can affect the surrounding people. Researchers have begun to identify some genes that are associated with both depression and with bipolar disorder. But when, while a person can inherit genes that make him or her more likely to experience bipolar disorder, this doesn't guarantee that he'll have the illness. It may not occur unless or until he has certain stressful life events during a vulnerable period in his life. The other reason it's a family illness is that family members and close friends such as you feel the mood shifts and the stress of living in the household of and in supporting someone who has this illness and they can be affected by this. One of the great tragedies of bipolar disorder or depression is that it means a life interrupted. These conditions are chronic and progressive often begin fairly early in life and frequently don't respond readily to treatment. They may interfere with your loved one's ability to participate fully in life. So the result can be a delay in educational pursuits, work and career paths that might have to be adjusted. Um, they can interfere with developing personal relationships and delay many of the natural transitions into adulthood that now have to be put on hold, such as living independently, manning their own finances. There's a list here on this slide that may resonate with some of you. It may impact the choice of, the choice of profession or the employer or the actual position a person takes with a possible need to take something less demanding or to find one that has certain employee benefit programs. It might affect school or professional advancement, promotions, and casual and romantic relationships and friendships as well. A life interrupted by mental illness is based on losses. For example, a person may lose their hopes and dreams, opportunities, time from their life, a certain lifestyle they had been used to now uh, interrupted by medical appointments and, and following treatment recommendations. There may be a loss of housing, of certain relationships, of self-esteem and self-respect. But your loved one who's affected by this illness and you need to acknowledge and to grieve these losses. You need to grieve the impact of mental illness and the life interrupted as a loss. How do you do this? Well, there are some steps we can recommend. The first is to just identify and to acknowledge that it is a loss. To think about it, process the loss, feel your feelings, whether it's anger, depression, denial, agitation, anxiety, whatever it is. Then try to accept and come to terms with that loss. Most people are able to bounce back. They find ways to accept and adapt to their loss, restore their sense of purpose and meaning and possibilities for happiness. Others have a harder time with that. 
the next step is to try to adapt. Adapting to loss means having to focus on the present, controlling what we can and letting go of what we can. It means seeing the future, it's holding possibilities for a life with purpose and meaning and joy and satisfaction. And then you put it to rest. Now, what helps you to be able to do this? There are some things. If you can try to focus and rely on your own personal strengths and coping skills, find alternative ways to express your grief. It could be in the arts or music, creative things. Stay connected with the others who are important in your life and take care of yourself. Otherwise, if you don't deal with your loss, if you try to ignore it or push it aside, then painful thoughts and memories will just periodically come back to haunt you and interfere with the quality of your life. Now, your presence here today tells me that you're searching for ways to help your loved one. I know you want answers. You're in a difficult position and you're doing the best you can. I am really sorry, there's no magic bullet or easy solution, but there are some things I'll share with you that can improve your situation. So let's begin by thinking about what you as a caregiver likely experience. You may have constant worry and concern about your loved one, a sense of feeling shut out or excluded, or fear that whatever you do isn't going to be helpful or make a difference anyway. Maybe your family life and plans are frequently interrupted, or personal finances are affected, and more of your energy goes towards dealing with your loved one's illness and life issues, and that puts stress on the whole family. Mood disorders are actually a full-time job. Everything seems to stop to accommodate your loved one's emotional issues and scheduled treatments and appointments. And this can be exhausting. You as a caregiver wanna provide support, but you also might feel a little need to take on total responsibility and be there as a constant companion. See that he or she eats. You might wanna do his laundry for him schedule appointments and provide transportation. You might want to excuse them of responsibilities or shared chores at home. Absolve him of his obligations, including those at school or work, and perhaps support him or her financially in the long run. It's really tempting to want to do these things. But wait a minute. Let's think about what's in the best interest of your family member and what's realistic for you to offer. There's a fine line you must honor between supporting your loved one and making him totally dependent on you. So you want to balance providing for him or her with allowing him to be as self-sufficient as is realistic. Now, as a caregiver, you may have many, many concerns. As a parent, you, you likely feel an added responsibility to guide and support your child through this illness and enable them to function in the world. You didn't expect your child would have to confront the challenges of a mental illness and perhaps have to change the direction of his life path. You're also having to learn about and deal with mental health diagnoses and perhaps substance abuse issues like alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs often used as a person's way to self-treat. If you're the parent of a teen or a young adult, you know that he or she is in transition into adulthood and trying hard to stand on their own. They don't wanna have a parent hovering, having you know their innermost emotional thoughts and fears and concerns and what they presume to be personal failures. Your college student or young adult may even return home during his illness. And this often creates additional layers of stress for everyone in the family. Your child is longing for privacy and independence and autonomy, making his own life choices and decisions without being controlled and whether that's right or wrong. Yet you wanna protect your child from the pain of the world and impart your hard earned life lessons to him. 
And so it's difficult for a parent to give up that role of protector, of keeping their child safe from harm. If your loved one's over the age of 18, privacy laws mean that you cannot direct his care or communicate with his mental health providers, except with his permission or in the case of an emergency. And as you've learned, you cannot force an adult over 18 into treatment unless he's in crisis, you believe he could be of harm to himself or others, or you need to take legal steps to ensure his safety. And that sets up a very difficult position to be in. For example, in the extremely ill, this might mean getting a court order to secure guardianship or to ensure he takes his medications. While it's difficult to do, you do have to respect his or her right to refuse your help or any professional treatment. If you're the spouse or the partner of someone who's affected, new and stressful factors may now affect your relationship. You might start assuming different roles with the healthy person, you, taking on more responsibility and for the household duties, for the family and for the relationship. Your daily routine and social life may change. More of the daily and financial responsibilities now rest on your shoulders. And when fatigued, you could come to resent being put in that position. You could also have intimacy and sexual difficulties as well. This can result from the illness or from the side effects of some of the medications used to treat it. You, as the healthy one, may feel a loss and a sense of isolation since your life partner is not as available to you as he or she had been in the past. You may not know the details of her emotional struggles or treatment and feel left out of the loop on important matters that infect the entire family. Sometimes a joint family meeting with the therapist can be helpful. It's meant to help everybody in the family understand the illness and how to best respond and be supportive and clear the air of any issues that are underlying. Now, if you're the child of a senior adult, you may have certain concerns. Older people are at risk as they face loneliness, loss of friends and family members, physical impairments that limit their lifestyle, medical problems, pain, or the loss of independence and purpose in life. And there can be obstacles to their receiving mental health treatment because the senior generation may regard mental illness as a weakness or as a character flaw and are thus really reluctant to seek professional mental health. Beyond the usual supportive strategies that I describe in my book, your primary job will be to ensure the safety of your loved one. Lastly, you may have concerns as a family member. Families often vary in their ability to adapt to stress, including mental illness. Some families cope well, some not so well. This is influenced by their social and financial resources, the family makeup, the availability of social support, and the presence of other illnesses. In families, the children of an affected person usually observe the behavior and language of their parents and pick up on the subtle cues that appear with, when one has mental illness. A child may also be at risk for developing depression herself later in life when raised in a family in which one parent has the illness. So try to be open and honest with children in an age appropriate way when a family member has bipolar disorder. Explain what's going on before their imaginations take over. You might say something like, well, daddy's not feeling very well right now and he saw his doctor and his doctor's gonna help him feel better. He may need to take some medications and we all have to be very patient. Something like that. Now, as a caregiver, you might notice that bipolar disorder or depression brings on special challenges. Your loved one might have a lack of insight into his illness 
it's that special sense of self-awareness and perspective. So he or she just might not grasp the cause of his deep despair or how to manage the symptoms. She might have an unrealistic expectations, expectations of the illness and of the treatment options and outcome. She may have difficulty sticking with treatment. For most of us, taking a medication, attending a weekly support group, or following health promoting behaviors are not too hard to do for a week or two. The challenge is in committing to these activities for a lifetime, accepting that fact and the necessity and keeping yourself motivated. Another thing is that your loved one may have an inability to detect the early warning signs characteristic of his illness. So each person who has a mood disorder has a characteristic set of signs that signal a change is going on in his or her illness. These are called warning signs, which you might observe as distinct changes from his baseline that precede an episode of depression or mania. For example, he might stop showering might not return calls from friends or family members, might have the, the laundry pile up or the mail accumulate on the dining room table. Your loved one may not be able to detect these signs, but you should be on the lookout for them and respond to any changes. Another thing is that a person affected may be unable to cope and deal with stress using his or her previously successful coping methods. So we may flounder. And the next thing surrounds lifestyle patterns. Those who have bipolar disorder or depression are greatly helped by keeping up a regular pattern of healthy lifestyle habits regular sleep, diet and nutrition, physical exercise, having a daily routine and structure, avoiding social isolation, things like that. And lastly, your loved one may feel far beyond any hope or help, may be convinced that this is a permanent state that will never improve, or that even if she were to get better, she has nothing to offer anyone and will never have a life worth living, a meaningful career or a fulfilling relationship. She might feel fundamentally flawed and defective, unlovable, incompetent, even if she has successfully overcome these episodes in the past. Another thing is that you might have also noticed that helping someone who has bipolar disorder is different and feels different from caring for a person with other me medical problems. And that carries a certain set of special challenges. For example, he or she may turn down offers of help from anyone rather than welcoming it. You might have heard, leave me alone. You don't understand. Nobody can help. It's not by choice, but rather because the illness affects one's mind and ways of thinking. There may be the challenge of stigma. Stigma is an unfounded negative judgment and criticism that's based on misinformation. It's an unfair label placed upon the person who has bipolar disorder or other mental illness and comes from other people, from images on TV or the media and can be quite difficult to confront. Another point surrounds the idea of confidentiality and sharing of healthcare information. The privacy of medical information is strictly prohibited by federal regulations in the United States. And this makes it difficult for you to speak in detail or share information with your family member's treatment team. So you may feel shut out from his evaluation and treatment decisions. You know, to a certain extent, that there's uncertainty around the outcome of some psychiatric treatments. We're all familiar with the expected guidelines and treatment outcomes for many other types of medical problems like a strep throat or a hip replacement. It's much harder to predict treatment outcomes for a mood disorder. 
Some people who have bipolar depression or mania respond to the first treatment. And some, like me, require many medications or treatment trials before they see a response and begin to feel like themselves again. They may have inconsistent responses to each episode. Just try not to assume that just because your loved one has been through an episode of bipolar depression or mania before, that she will know how to manage it this time. And lastly, there's a lack of established routines for caregivers such as yourself. We all usually know how to respond to a heart attack or a cancer diagnosis. We know how to dial 911 in an emergency, when to bring casseroles in funny movies and do fundraising walks for medical conditions. But family and friends who provide support are still not comfortable in knowing just what to say and do for a person who has a mood disorder, how best to help. So given these challenges, let's now think about what your loved one wants and needs. He or she wants to feel normal and get his life back or the parts of his life that were good or perhaps improve his life. She wants to feel connected to others including feeling accepted and fitting in with the peer group. She wants to maintain autonomy. That's where one makes independent decisions, acting on her own values and interests and having a voice in treatment without being fully controlled by another person, such as maybe you. Yet he or she still wants and needs the involvement and guidance from a parent while having some freedom to have a say in what happens to her. It's a balance, if you're a parent, between your child's desire for independence and guidance from both you and her healthcare provider. Similar thing may happen with a spouse or another family member. Other things a person really wants to have is to feel heard and that his or her thoughts and feelings are legitimate, to feel support and to recover and thrive. Your loved one needs to know that you are there, that you listen and that he or she is heard. For suggested specific communication techniques and language on what to say and do and what not to say and do, I refer you to my most recent book. Well, now all of this brings us to the question, what is the ultimate goal? The goal is recovery. What's recovery? Well, some define it as the ability to function in life as each of us define and desire it. It's often described as an ongoing process of regaining control of your life after psychiatric diagnosis and all of the losses that accompany it that we just discussed. SAMHSA has another definition that describes it as a process of change whereby a person improves his health and wellness, lives a self-directed life and strives to reach his first his full potential, excuse me. But recovery is a long-term ongoing process. It has many ups and downs and occasional setbacks. It's not a straight line. There's a widespread belief, however, that better is not good enough. It is possible and realistic for those of us who have a mental illness to expect wellness. Effective persons desire a life of being more productive, more financially secure and independent, more engaged in personal relationships and an opportunity to thrive rather than just merely function or survive. So you might wonder what does recovery and wellness look like? Well, it, it includes a life that's meaningful to him or her with that has purpose and direction and is based on her own needs and beliefs and convictions, where she makes use of personal talents and potential, and he manages his life situations pretty well, 
has positive relationships and accepts himself. So now let's talk about things you can do. First of all, be there. Be present, interested, and pay attention. You want to provide support. Support includes listening without judging, hearing what she says, and hearing and listening are actually two different things, and then responding with empathy to the person's words. You want to accept what he or she says as a valid rep representation of what he's feeling and experiencing, even if it seems inaccurate or distorted to you at the time, or if you disagree, do not argue. There'll be a time later to help him challenge distortions in his thinking and replace it with more accurate thoughts. You want to treat him normally. Make it clear that you include him and expect him to participate in family activities, share in daily household chores, and keep up with responsibilities at school or work. He doesn't want to feel left out or different because of his illness. Let him be the one to determine whether it's too much to handle. You can help him or her modify his activities as needed, but try not to give her an easy out. Next, be impeccable with your word. Do not promise what you can't realistically deliver. Do what you say you're going to do and try to follow through. Another thing you can do is be a role model for healthy lifestyle and behavior and encourage him or her to stick with the basics of mental health. That include taking medications, getting regular sleep, diet, exercise, structure and routine, avoiding isolation, things like that. In your conversations, try to communicate hope. One way to do this is to keep her plans alive for the future, keep her plans for the future alive in your conversations, even if those plans have to be modified for now. You could suggest she borrow help from someone who cares for her and believes she has potential and that person could be you. Through your eyes, she may begin to see the possibilities in her life return. And lastly, you wanna set realistic expectations. Right now, he may not be able to do everything he used to do and that's actually okay. Encourage him to do what he can do right now, even if it has to modify the plans. If he needs to take a leave of absence from work or school, treat it as a temporary setback and not as a failure. Talk about his realistic plans for the future and try to support his efforts to get there. Remember that some people take this illness as an opportunity to rethink their ambitions and life direction. And they may make other more appealing decisions about their life goals and aspirations. Now, finally, as needed, you might need to set limits and expectations and boundaries on your person's behavior and how she relates with other family members or friends. Having a mental illness does not give anyone the right to be overly argumentative or demanding of others' time and patience. Boundaries are rules or limits on behavior that are created and agreed upon by you and your loved one. Together, you both agree beforehand about what will be considered problematic or unacceptable behavior. Begin by clearly and firmly defining what you will or will not tolerate and remain clear and consistent regarding any consequences for breaches in your agreement and try to stick with them. Sometimes you need to try a tough love approach. With tough love, you remain firm yet loving, holding him or her to previously agreed upon limits and making him accountable for wayward behavior and choices. A tough love approach has consequences for misbehavior 
and you must maintain and be consistent and steady in enforcing those. Now, you might wonder, how do you stand back and let your loved one manage his own life and make his mistakes, even when you disagree? It's a fine line. You want to provide for him, you'd allow him to be self-sufficient, as I said. It's really hard for parents to sit back and watch what unfolds without intervening, as well as the spouse or other family members. Some people will be able to live independently. Others do better in a group home environment or at home with you. Some will be able to return to work or school or a training program fairly soon, while others will be delayed in this. So, here are some suggestions on what to do. First, give your loved one room to learn how to live with his illness. Make his own mistakes. Live with the consequences of her decisions and mistakes and learn to thrive. You want to learn your own limitations and be clear and specific in offering what you will do and what you can do for your loved one and what you cannot without feeling guilty. You want to consider any cognitive or thought impairments or functional impairments that your loved one has and his level of maturity at the moment. Make sure he has an, all the essentials to live on and that he or she receives professional mental health and physical health treatment. Try to be supportive, stay neutral and calm, listen, and try not to argue or be dismissive. Then take a deep breath. Now, some people have a hard time accepting treatment for mental illness, and they might reject offers of help from anyone. The concern is that a person often lacks insight into his illness, is the last one to recognize what's going on and many times doesn't even realize he needs professional help. There are a lot of reasons for a person to re refuse help. They might be concerned about privacy issues, fear that his or her friends, classmates, coworkers, or employer will find out. Fear of losing a job or a scholarship because of the stigma of mental illness. Maybe she thinks it indicates she's weak and is a failure or makes her feel vulnerable or, in, or that it's intrusive. Perhaps your loved one is worried about the financial issues in paying for treatment for his bipolar disorder. You might believe it's just not effective for him. Perhaps he or she fears becoming dependent on medications, dreads the side effects he's heard of, or believes the rumors that he'll feel like a zombie or lose creativity on medications. And she may be concerned that therapy will raise up strong emotions that will be very uncomfortable to have to deal with at that point. So what can you do when your loved one refuses treatment? Well, you want to first begin by reinforcing your love and concern, and then clearly state what's different from her usual self. Mention specific symptoms you've observed, what's different, and emphasize that they're symptoms of an illness and that treatment may help relieve them. Emphasize that these symptoms and his problems won't improve on their own and that some savvy help might be necessary for him or her to feel better. Help your loved one understand the reasons that he or she might be refusing treatment and appeal to the fact that treatment may be the only one she can realize her dreams of finishing school, getting back to work, enjoying herself with friends, doing things she had previously been interested in, whatever parts of life she's missing out on now help her realize it will be extremely difficult to achieve these goals in the current state without treatment. 
You want to try to provide clear and reliable information. Once you know your family member's concerns, you or his provider can address those worries with facts. If misinformation about mental illness is the issue, provide him with accurate information from reliable sources. Now, sometimes your loved one who has bipolar disorder may have suicidal thoughts or might even try to make an attempt. This happens when the deep emotional pain exceeds the, exceeds the person's ability to cope with it. Handle this as a psychiatric emergency. Emphasize that although driven by strong urges, emotions will change and in time will pass. There are some people who are at increased risk for suicide. For example, teenagers and young adults, in part because of the stress they're under to succeed and the pressure to fit in with their peers. Older people are at risk as they face loneliness, the loss of friends and family, impairments physically that limit their lifestyle and the loss of independence and purpose. So your best response is to ensure your loved one's safety, then sit down and discuss his or her feelings and thoughts on death and suicide, if you're comfortable doing this. Make sure he or she has no access to lethal means such as pills, firearms, knives, ropes. Provide them with support and a strong connection to you, other friends and family members, his community, and call his mental health provider or 911. The goal is to keep your loved one safe and, and have her evaluated by an experienced mental health professional. And remember that while you can offer support, and provide for his safety, you're not responsible for the actions of someone else and you cannot control what he or she might eventually decide to do. So now let's talk about you. A lot will change in your life and that of other family members when you assume the role of caregiver for your loved one. There'll likely be changes in your family life and routine your personal space, perhaps your finances with increased medical bills, grocery bills, transportation, non-medical expenses. Then you might have change in sleep in your time for your own personal care, physical exercise, activities and hobbies, ability to sit and relax and personal relationships that may dwindle. Things that make life meaningful you and decrease your stress may change. But remember, you can't help anybody else if you don't take care of yourself first. And there are three parts to this. You need to acknowledge your own emotions, pace yourself, and take care of yourself. So begin by acknowledging your own emotion, distress, frustration, anger, sadness, grief, disappointment, whatever it is. I know that some of you may be grieving right now, sorrowful over the losses that often accompany your loved one's bipolar disorder, such as the loss of plans for his or her future, your personal hopes and dreams and opportunities, um, education that might be interrupted, financial security, loss of perceived social standing in the community, perhaps, loss of time. Accept these as losses and understand that they're significant to the life and mental health of both you and your loved one. Your feelings are real and valid. Tell yourself it's okay and then give yourself permission to grieve as I spoke about earlier. The second point is to pace yourself. Do only what you can realistically do in reasonable small steps and with periodic breathers. Be realistic and set clear expectations and limits on what you can and will do and learn to say no. And lastly, 
take care of yourself. Make your own self-care priority. Take steps to see that your usual daily routines and those of the other family members are maintained and protected and that there's emotional outlets and supports in place for you and the other members of your family. You wanna aim for a regular routine in your own life, such as sleep, eat, exercise, working, socializing, intentionally relaxing. Include your hobbies and things that bring you pleasure and restore you. Including self-care routines, such as going to the hairdresser or out to lunch with friends. You want to follow the basics of mental health. And that we talked about earlier, which is sleep, diet, exercise, etc. And seek help from friends and other family members or support group. You cannot do this alone. A caregiver such as yourself can be at risk for burnout. Burnout's a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion that's caused by prolonged stress the sense of having reached the limits of your endurance and your ability to cope. It's a result of too many demands on your strength, your resources, time, and energy, and goes beyond your ability to deal with it. So there are ways you can avoid burnout. First is to attend to your own and your other family members' needs, to get enough sleep, food, exercise, etc., and to try to stay organized to make it a point to keep up with your own pleasurable hobbies and social activities and your friends and not to feel guilty about doing that. Try to learn what you can about your loved one's illness and set clear limits as I've already mentioned. Now, let's take a little time to talk about some difficult situations you may encounter and problem solve around. If your loved one becomes emotionally upset, his or her ability to think and reason declines, and he isn't able to address his thoughts or problems in a clear manner. So it's useless for you or others to disagree or argue with him. It's best to step back, allow him some time to cool off, and then make yourself available to talk when he's ready. Your loved one with bipolar disorder might feel angry he could be angry with his own personal situation and having his life turned upside down by this illness. Angry by just having to deal with a mental illness at all. He could be angry with himself, with his healthcare providers, with you just because you're there, with a family member who doesn't understand his struggles or an employer for letting him go. He could be angry because he has, he has to try to cope with change, change in his daily routine and being separated from work or school or friends or colleagues, changes in his financial status and security, his living situation or his recreational opportunities. Remember, if your loved one does appear hostile or very angry. It's generally not helpful to respond in a similar angry manner. That can just escalate the situation. And it might also add to your own personal stress. So instead, try to stay calm. Step back. If you can, show you recognize the source of his anger and emotions, but do that only if you know for sure, because otherwise that will backfire. Now, some of you may have encountered a family member who experiences psychosis. Psychosis is an altered condition of the mind where the person loses his sense of reality. And he might have hallucinations or delusions or disordered thoughts and speech. It can be caused by some medications, alcohol or drug abuse or mental illness. And it requires professional mental health treatment. And lastly is substance abuse. Your loved one may try to see, treat to self-treat with substances. Alcohol is the most common substance abuse in the world, and marijuana is the most commonly abused drug in the world. Your best response is to try to ensure dual diagnosis treatment and a reputable program. 
But since getting your loved one to agree is a major challenge, one thing you can try is to appeal to his desire to fulfill a dream or a goal that's not possible while under the influence. And in closing, here's a quote I found. Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. I believe you all have courage. And now I thank you for your time today and give special thanks to Natalie for organizing this webinar. Now we'll have some time for your questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. It looks like we have time to do a Q&A, so I'll get started with some of the questions. Um, for what? our first question, someone asked, how do you question your loved one who believes and states things that you know to be untrue without challenging or alienating them? That's an excellent question. Thank you for that. It depends on their, their level of distress at the moment. What you want to do is to try and present them with some facts that are re reasonable facts and that are backed up by some um, evidence that's reliable. And some of this you can find online. Some of it you may get from his or her provider but try and do it in a non-confrontational way. You could, you could begin by saying something like, hmm, that's really interesting. I, I see what you're saying. Have you thought about it in this way? Because, and then perhaps state some of the fact. Great, thank you. One way to try. Thank you. Um, so for our next question, someone asked, how can I check in on my son who has been recently diagnosed without annoying him? I don't want to ask how he is doing or if he's taking his medications every time I see him, but I want to make sure he's okay. That's another great question and it's commonly um, uh, occurs with many families. Sometimes it depends on the age of your son. If your son is, you know, an adolescent or a teenager, you have a little bit more ability to kind of wiggle in and ask those questions because you have, um, you're perhaps more involved in his day-to-day day -day life. Um, you want to ask questions that are not direct questions um, and that require a specific answer rather than just a yes or no answer. You know, you often get, how are you doing? Fine, one word answers but try and, and direct your question to something more specific in your life, in his, his or her life uh, that he might be doing, such as at work or school uh, or a project or an activity or um, a team sport perhaps, and ask specific questions about that rather than him um, where he feels like it might be more intrusive. Great, thank you. For our next question, someone asked, with a child who is in college, do you have any suggestions for how to reach out to friends that can contact us if they see any problems? I, I presume you mean the uh, child's friends? Yes, I think um, that's Yeah, well, there's that, that's kind of difficult because, um, uh, uh, the child in college is more than likely over 18 and you don't have the ability to direct his care or to even interfere in his care. And he may interpret your reaching out to his friends as being very intrusive and overbearing. You might want to engage him in a conversation that says, Gee, you know, sometimes we can't see what's happening in ourselves and other people can observe it a little bit better. Would it be okay if your friends um, look, you know, the, the immediate friends that he's, he or she is most uh, involved with, you know, if your friends kept an eye open and perhaps um, communicated with all of us, um, if anything were needed? 
um, but bring him into the to the the discussion and into the decision on whether or not to involve his other friends. Um, because the other thing is they just might also not be interested or feel comfortable doing that. Thank you, that's a great explanation. Um, so for our next question, somebody expressed that they noticed medications do seem to flatten or dampen their creativity. Um, and it can be very frustrating for them. So how, as caregivers, can they be supportive? Well, first of all, to accept that as a valid comment or statement that the person makes, to not just dismiss it and say, oh, no, no, these medications are fine, you're, you're okay, uh, you're over-exaggerating or um, whatever. Um, and then you might encourage the person to speak with his mental health provider to bring that point up saying, gee, my ability to paint or write poetry or play music is impacted and, and that's affecting the quality of my life. And perhaps have a discussion around changing to a different medication. Okay, great, thank you. Um, for our next question, someone wanted to know if you have any insight on how to restore a relationship between a mother and a daughter that has been broken for years without any communication. It's really difficult to do. And I presume you mean that to be related to have one having mental illness. Um, both parties need to want this to happen. Um, so you could want it and take all the steps you want. And if it falls on deaf ears, then it, it's not going to help. Um, what you might try to do is to um, center it around some common um, uh, interest that the two of you share and try to build on that. Maybe it's going to museums or reading a book or doing you know pottery and try and build on that rather than just the immediate face to face um it's kind of like a workaround that's one thing to try okay great thank you for those tips um next someone wanted to know what is a certified peer specialist great question thank you a certified peer specialist is a person who has lived experience with mental illness, such as bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, is on a recovery path, and then has been formally trained uh, by a certified course, formally trained and certified by state examination to work with other people and uh, in individually or in groups. Um, and they're working now to make it a national exam, but right now it's just done state by state. And the training program is between 40 and 70 hours, I think, to, um, um, it, it may vary between programs. Awesome, thank you for explaining that. Um, so for our next question, someone asked, my daughter has given us permission to speak with her therapist what are some good questions to ask him? That's excellent. Um, you want to ask um, what his approach is to treating her particular problems. Um, you want to ask what the treatment recommendations or options are that you, he and your daughter have discussed and so that you can understand what's going on. You want to understand and ask about side effects to treatment and ask in his opinion how you can be most helpful um, in, in that he knows her and, and her goals and, and desires. So that might give you some tips on how to be supportive and what kind of steps to take. Um, so those are some of the beginning things to, to uh, bring up with, his, with her therapist. Great, thank you. Um, so that looks like all the time we have for questions, but I just wanted to 
quickly address for everyone who was asking um, where you can find Dr. Noonan's books or her website or um, rewatch a recording of this webinar. All of those materials will be available on our website tomorrow. So if you go under educational videos, you can find the recording and I will link um, the link to all of her books and her website. So you can access those there. Um, and thank you for everyone who attended today and asked your questions. And of course, a big thank you to Dr. Noonan for joining us today and sharing your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. And thank you for your questions.